Hello and good evening, everyone. We welcome you to the second session of the 2021 Spring Speaker Series. We've chosen to highlight the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community in this series as we begin the community engagement and outreach phase of the planning process. My name is Melaine Jackson, and I'm the co-lead with my fellow colleague, Philip Estes, for the Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan. If you were not able to attend last Tuesday, you missed a good one, and we encourage you to go back and review the first session because these sessions are like chapters to a good book. As we continue to cultivate working partnerships, we first acknowledge from, from which we came so that we can have a better understanding of how our process and systems impact people. Like this session, we will focus on uh, putting people first with an acute focus on racial equity and social justice. We kicked off this series in a converse, with a conversation intentionally spotlighting the stories of both Sarah Lee and Melinda Jackson. We also heard about a wonderful example from uh, a wonderful example about youth stewardship uh, of how it can make a difference and an impact in the Fairland community. We aim to carry we aim to carry on with this people first approach throughout the planning process, and we aspire to make our systems more human and relatable to all members of the community. The purpose of this second session is to highlight the importance of uh, improved pedestrian safety. We will discuss a, multi, a more multiple, a more multimodal pedestrian and bike friendly approach, a tongue tie, a tongue twister, I apologize, achieving achieved through the uh, transportation planning efforts. You will hear from planning staff about the transportation strategies uh, and when done with a deliberate and intent, intent with mindfulness can be used to promote racial equity and social justice to provide safe and convenient access to the BRT service, uh, the BRT stations, retail, commercial uses, residential neighborhoods, parks and open spaces within the community. With that being said, we acknowledge the role that our plans and policies have played in creating and perpetuating racial inequities in Montgomery County. But we, we are committed to transforming the way that we work as we seek to address, mitigate, eliminate inequities in the past, from the past, and develop planning, policy, planning solutions to create equitable communities in the future. While it will take some time to fully develop new methodologies for equity in, planning, in the planning process. We cannot delay in applying a racial equity and social justice lens to our work. In doing so, we celebrate the county's diversity, connect our shared humanities by supporting collaboration and the commitment of, of advancing while modeling best practices around racial equity and social justice, diversity and inclusion in all aspects of our work. This event, demonstrates our commitment to embracing equity and non-discriminatory non practices, regardless of race, religion, creed, or lack thereof, color, age, gender, expression, sexual, sexual orientation, class, language, and ability. As we continue to develop the master plan, as well as new methodologies, this series will spark a broad but deep understanding of the importance of cultural competency. And it is, it is truly, it, and it is what is truly means to, what it means to build a resilient community together. The planning department's role in this process is to be another conduit for community collaboration, with the primary goal of setting the table for equitable planning process process and systems moving forward. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Council Member Will Jawando. Council Member Will Jawando has has held a at large seat on the Montgomery County Council since June of 2018. He also grew up in the Long Branch community and lives in Colesville. He is all too familiar with the legacy of the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community. His leadership and community advocacy for equal treatment of all people of all backgrounds through legislation makes him the perfect candidate to provide opening marks, remarks for today's event. Council member Will Jawando is no stranger to the topic of the importance of people first transportation planning. And I'm sure he will share his current initiatives and personal experiences in his opening remarks. After we hear from Will Jawando, we will also, he will introduce our moderator for this evening, Lauren Campbell, who is also a member of our master planning team. So with that being said, let's get started. 
Council Member Will Jawando, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Wonderful. And I'm sorry that you all can't also see me, but hopefully uh, the uh, voice will do. I, th I appreciate it, Molly, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here today to help kick off uh, the second of the speaker series and to bring attention uh, to people first solutions uh, to transportation planning. Um, this is a very, very important topic and something that's very dear to my heart. Um, and I want to thank the planning board and everyone involved uh, for their interest in this important issue. As we are trying to recover uh, from COVID, uh, we know that it has ravaged not only our community in terms of death, uh, in the economic fallout, but also in uh, inequitably. Uh, we know that go down any indicator, uh, um, forty percent of Black businesses gone uh, because of COVID. Uh, the uh, Black and Latino residents much more likely to contract COVID and and die younger from it. Uh, and, and the least likely to be vaccinated, even as we have right now reached a great mile, milestone of 60% of our residents receiving at least the first vaccine. We know in Vision Zero and our efforts to have a safe road, roadways, uh, that even during the pandemic and prior to, but especially during the pandemic, we saw more people on our roads uh, that were killed or have been involved in accidents than in the previous year. We've had more pedestrian and cyclist deaths in 2020 than we did in 2019, despite the pandemic. That underscores this inequity. We've had people who have had to go to work, the essential worker, uh, the low wage worker that whether if they go there, don't go to work, their family wasn't eating. Um, the people who are reliant on transportation that was sporadic or non-existent or taking their own lives at risk to, to find it and to get it. Um, we know that this all contributes to a lower quality of life. Um, and anyone who spent amount of time on our roads this year, or this past year, saw an increase in reckless driving, uh, in failed road design, uh, and particularly in, in these same communities uh, of color and where low income and our immigrant residents are, where you have increased risk uh, in the opposite of people first uh, planning because of the way we've developed here. And you've seen speeding and reckless driving and a disregard for those who are traveling on our roads that aren't in cars. Um, and so we have come to a point where this was a very important emergency before COVID, uh, but post COVID, uh, it's even more important. Um, and so we've taken some steps on the council and I've been proud to lead on some of them. We've reduced the fares uh, for and, and kept fares at bay on ride on until September and, and, and are proposing to eliminate them over the course of time, and and we're going to take those steps forward. Uh, we I propose doubled funding for the Safe Routes to School program so that we can invest in making sure as our students return all the way, uh, and realizing that some are back now, but but many more will be back in the fall, that they have a safe way to get to and from school, particularly in those walk sheds leading up to the school. Um, and so we know that. Uh, public transit, accessibility, uh, road design, uh, people first planning for bicycles, for multimodal, uh, for walkers, uh, for public transportation, we have to do better. Uh, on the Fed committee, we took up last year the Beers Mill mm -hmm. Master Plan, which was the first one under Vision Zero, which was did take that approach. And it was one quarter and that we did really well and working with planning, great plan that they sent to us, but there's much more work to do. Um, and until we do it, we're going to see, keep seeing these disparities. So that's why these listening and speaker series and sessions are so important uh, to talk about the issues that we're facing and that we're seeing here so that we can address them and accelerate things like bus rapid transit and our sidewalk uh, production near, across schools and our complete streets program, all in line with really what do people need to do? Where do they need to go? to get access to jobs, employment, get their kids to and from school safety, our seniors, and do it in a safe way. Um, and so there's a lot to do. Uh, it's everything from making sure our MC dot rider apps are, are on time uh, and accurate information to increasing uh, our, our uh, complete street programming 
across our master plan process and, and sector plan processes. And there's legislation that we're going to need to do. Uh, you know, I've, I've put in two bills related to more housing. We need to build more housing in transit corridors in denser areas. Uh, so there's a lot to do, and these are multifaceted issues, um, and they're all connected. But the Fairland Bricks Cheney plan, I'm really excited about it because this is an area where you kind of have a lot of these things going on at the same time. And it, it's an opportunity for us to say in a bold way, like we did in Veers Mill, here's our vision for what should be happening. Here's what's equitable. Here's how we provide opportunity, safety, uh, and a sense of community in place for everyone uh, in our uh, community. So with that, uh, I look forward to the conversation. My staff will be here as well. Uh, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm going to turn, turn it over to our moderator, Lauren Campbell, who's a transportation planner with Montgomery County's Up County Division. And she holds a master's degree in environmental and urban planning from Arizona State and a bachelor's degree in transportation systems and urban infrastructures from Morgan State University in Baltimore, one of our great HBCUs. So look forward to uh, watching the discussion and appreciate everyone coming tonight. Thank you, Councilman Jawando, for your continued support and leadership. Welcome and thank you all for joining us this evening and being a part of this dynamic discussion to come. As Councilman Jawando said, I am Lauren Campbell, the lead transportation planner for the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan. We here at Montgomery County Planning are very pleased that you all have joined us this evening for the second session in our spring speaker series on community conversations in Fairland. We are focusing on these community centric conversations as we're in the process of updating the 1997 Fairland Master Plan. On the, on the transportation side, this updated master plan will explore connectivity and pedestrian safety in Fairland and how to create a better transp transportation environment for all. We're here tonight to get a better understanding, to push the conversation of what it truly means to build a resilient community together with a session appropriately titled The Importance of People First Transportation Planning. Tonight, our discussion will dive deep into the origins of Vision Zero, the pedestrian master plan, and presents the latest data produced from these plans. We're also here, we'll also hear from neighborhood champions that will highlight their professional research and endeavors and their personal pedestrian experiences in the Fairland community. To help me dive deeper into this conversation, we have our esteemed panelists composed of Charles Brown, a senior researcher for Allen M. Voorhees Transportation Center, Jesse McGowan, who is our lead transportation planner for Vision Zero and transit planning for the Montgomery County Planning Department, Shannon Minnick, Director of Independent Living Services for Independence Now, and Rochelle Herrett, Prince George's County Independent Living Special, also representing Independence Now. At the end of our panel um, discussion, we'll open the floor to questions and answers, so feel free to drop your questions in the chat as the conversation unfolds. Before we get started, I would like for us to take a moment of silence to honor anyone who has lost their lives in transportation related related accidents, as well as the late George Floyd, who was unfortunately tragically killed one year ago on this day, May 25th, 2020, a day that ignited international solidarity for racial equity and social justice. Racial equity, social justice, accessibility, and shared streets are major areas of focus for Montgomery County. The Fairland Bridge Cheney Master Plan will establish a clear vision for an equitable, just, and prosperous future for the Fairland community. I want to get this conversation going with Charles. Charles, give me your professional background and experience in racial equity, social justice, health and transportation infrastructure. Do you mind kicking, kicking us off with your presentation and a brief introduction of yourself? Yes, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Lauren. Next slide, please. Um, my name is Charles T. Brown. Uh, I am founder, CEO of Equitable Cities. I previously served as a senior researcher with the Allen M. Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers University, also as an adjunct professor at the Edward J. Blousey School of Planning and Public Policy. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here with each of you today. I would like to start by saying as a street level researcher, and pracademic. I've learned through working in and with racialized minority and low income populations across the country that transportation has been weaponized as a tool of oppression within society. 
Next slide. Unfortunately, the dominant narrative remains that of which is all behavioral. It's the choices we make, whether individually or collectively. Next slide. While we are definitely responsible for our own behavior, we cannot, however, ignore the role that the built environment plays in influencing our behavior, both positively and negatively. See, I'm thankful for my colleagues in public health who are encouraging transportation and mobility professionals to instead of focusing downstream, to focus upstream so they can see the impact and the connection between risky behaviors, our living conditions, institutional inequities, and most importantly, social inequities. This is important because there exists these very vivid and direct connections from and to institutional inequities, to social inequities, to living conditions, then to risk behaviors. See, it's not simply just a matter of choosing to cross at an intersection or mid-block. You really are responding to the environments of which you find yourself in. And to better illustrate this point, to highlight the role that transportation, mobility, and urban planners and engineers across the country, the role that they've played in these decisions. Let's go to the next slide. We must understand how we got here. And so in looking at the Washington DC metropolitan region, what you can see here is a map of where we live. The blue represents where our white brothers and sisters live. The green represents where our black brothers and sisters live. The purple represents where Hispanic populations live, our brothers and sisters who are Hispanic, Latino. And then lastly, um, the orange and the pink and yellow represents where our Asian and other brothers and sisters live. I would invite you for a quick second to ponder what do you see in this map? But as you're seeing this within DC, I don't want you to think that DC is unique in this respect. Next slide. I also want you to consider what you see in the city of Detroit. If green represents where black people live and blue represents where white live and purple represents where Hispanics live, what do you see? Let's not stop at Detroit, however, let's keep going. Next slide. Let's now go to Houston, Texas, one of the largest metropolitan um, areas in the US, one of the largest cities in the US. If blue represents where white people live, green where blacks, purple, Hispanic, what do you see in Houston? We're not gonna pick on Houston, we're gonna keep going. Next slide. This is Atlanta, the black Mecca currently, sorry DC. And if this happens to be the black Mecca, what do you see in Atlanta? And why was this such a focal point in the presidential election? Next slide. Well, if you haven't seen it by now, hopefully the next two slides gives you a better idea of what you see here, and that is racial residential segregation. Whether you are in New York City, Atlanta, uh, DC, and next slide, or Portland, Oregon, what you see is segregation. So much so in Portland that you don't even see the presence of a great majority of um, black populations, Hispanic populations, and Asian populations. Why? Well, because there was an institution that decided due to the social construct of race that they didn't belong. Next slide. And so what we've learned as a result of this, going back to the individual decision making, is that it has consequences because race determines place, which determines health. Last slide, please. And so then what we find is that history doesn't say goodbye. History says see you later, and that later is right now. The question is, however, what are you gonna do about it? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Charles, for that. We'll dive deeper into that presentation with the questions I have. Um, but to further improve our transportation systems through equity and safety, Montgomery County is one of the first counties and suburban communities to commit to Vision Zero. 
Jesse, do you mind telling us more about Vision Zero and the work that you do for Montgomery County? Yes, thank you. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, one more, please. So as Lauren mentioned, um, I'm Jesse Cohn McGowan. I'm a transportation planner at the planning department. Um, I lead Vision Zero and transit planning for Montgomery County's planning department. So we've been tossing around the term Vision Zero a bit tonight for those of you who may not be familiar. Vision Zero is an approach to transportation safety and transportation planning that says that no loss of life is acceptable. And so we really must work towards zero deaths and severe injury. Next slide, please. So Vision Zero and transportation safety is a serious topic, and, and this presentation will talk about some of the county's data and some of our major safety challenges, but I don't want to lose sight of the human aspect of transportation safety. And I think Charles touched on this a bit in his presentation and the lives impacted and lost to traffic violence. And so these are headlines from fatalities within Montgomery County um, in recent years. And so over the past several years, Montgomery County has seen dozens of lives lost um, in transportation crashes and hundreds of people have suffered life altering injuries. Next slide, please. I also just want to mention that this is an issue that's really personal to me. Um, this didn't occur in Montgomery County, but in 2010, almost 11 years ago, I personally lost a close friend in a bicycle crash. Um, this, my friend Paige Hicks, she was a college student at the time and she was struck by a truck while cycling on a country road in rural South Dakota. And this incident really fundamentally changed my life. Um, and it's why I work in transportation planning and do the work um, that I'm talking about here tonight. And so, you know, there's nothing that Paige individually could have done to prevent the crash that ended her life, but there is work that we as transportation professionals and planners can do to improve road conditions so that fewer people experience life altering injuries um, or the tragic loss of a friend or family member to traffic violence. So next slide, please. As I mentioned, transportation safety is a major issue within Montgomery County. Um, between 2015 and 2019, there were almost 60,000 traffic crashes within the county. And these are reported crashes. We know that some crashes do go unreported, so the number is even higher than this. And we had over 1,000 severe injuries and fatalities. Um, and just, so just to briefly point out, when I say 59,000 reported crashes, that's saying that we had roughly 32 crashes every day over that five-year period. Next slide, please. So as a suburban jurisdiction, um, there's a few trends we've noticed that contribute to the safety challenges on our roadways. Um, and so the first is that we have a lot of high speed arterials that connect our different activity centers through in Mon throughout Montgomery County. Um, the posted speed limits on these roadways often range from 40 to 50 miles per hour, and the actual travel speeds can be even higher than that. And these speeds can be deadly, especially for pedestrians and bicyclists. Next slide, please. Um, second, protected crossings for pedestrians and bicyclists are often spaced infrequently on some of these roads. And there may it may require you to walk 15 or 20 minutes out of your way just to cross at a marked crosswalk or at a signal. And so it's common when you're in this situation, you know, I might not have time, I'm trying to get to work to um, divert 20 minutes out of my way. And so, of course, some people choose to cross at locations that don't have crosswalks or don't have signals. And that, um, you know, can be a safety challenge. And so this is something we know that we really need to work on within the county. Um, next slide, please. Third, as a county that was kind of originally designed for movement of the automobile, we've really underinvested in walking and bicycling infrastructure such that there's insufficient space and separation for um, people who want to walk and bike on some of our high speed roads and many of our roads don't even have sidewalks at all and, and our amenities associated with transit are often pretty limited as you can see in this picture on the right. Um, next slide please. Finally, land uses along the corridors have not kept pace with the changing characteristics of our roadways. So many of our suburban arterials were initially two lane roads with low traffic volumes that were lined with homes with driveways like what you see on the screen. But over time, um, many of these roadways have been expanded to four or six lanes, but the low density development pattern along them has not really kept pace. And so we see that our roadways really have land use that encourages higher speeds um, what, on, what, on roadways that are still really very much residential streets. So next slide, please. So, so what are we doing about that? Um, Lauren mentioned that Montgomery County was one of the first suburban jurisdictions or counties to 
adopt Vision Zero, which is the idea that um, traffic deaths are preventable and that we need to work towards zero traffic fatalities and severe injuries. And so this slide just shows a comparison between a traditional approach to transportation planning and Vision Zero. So kind of I already said this a few times, but just to reiterate, a traditional approach says that traffic deaths are inevitable. Um, in the United States, we see roughly 40,000 um, traffic deaths a year, and Vision Zero says that that's unacceptable. We can't just kind of slowly, incrementally work our way down. We need to be thinking big picture about how we can really make dramatic changes and work towards zero um, traffic fatalities. Secondly, um, the traditional approach assumes perfect human behavior, that people are always going to walk to that crosswalk, even if it's farther away, that people are always going to drive the speed limit. But we know that that's not true. We know that people make mistakes. And so Vision Zero is about designing our system to accommodate human error and understanding that sometimes people will make mistakes. We don't want people to look at their phone while they drive, but if they do, what, how would we design the roadway network so that if a crash occurs, the severity of that crash is lower? Um, the third principle around Vision Zero is that we really focus our investments not just on preventing collisions, but on preventing severe and fatal crashes. So the one of the most common type of crashes are rear ends. And you know, while no one likes to get into a fender bender, the priority in Vision Zero is really focusing on what are the crash types that lead to severe injuries and fatalities, and how can we invest in um, reducing those types of crashes. Um, the fourth item here about individual responsibility versus a systems approach kind of gets back to that idea of human behavior. We really have to think about what we're doing um, collaboratively and as a system, thinking about transportation and land use hand in hand, and what we can do as planners to really create a system that reduces severe injuries and fatalities rather than relying exclusively on individual behavior. Um, and lastly, there's a principle that saving lives is inexpensive. We don't, there are strategies that we can take that are um, affordable that we can use to reduce severe injuries and fatalities. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and so lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about the planning department's role in Vision Zero. So um, as the planning department, our role is focused primarily on planning. Um, we are not the implementing agency for um, capital projects but we do have a role to play when it comes to Vision Zero. And so the first of those is master planning. Um, through our master plans, we set the long-term vision for the county's corridors. Um, secondly, we conduct development and capital project review to ensure that new projects align with the vision and design standards set out for the corridor. And then we also conduct data analysis. So similar to just some of the simple crash statistics that I showed on the first, on some earlier slides, um, we really dive into the data to try to understand what are the characteristics associated with crashes and how do we identify the right solutions to improve safety. And then lastly, our work often involves working directly in the, with the community with events like this um, and ideally in-person events in a post-COVID world um, to really, um, you know, kind of understand what the safety needs are within different communities within Montgomery County and push for a continued prioritization of safety. So next slide, please. Um, that's the end of my presentation and I'm you know, eager to be part of this panel and conversation. So thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Jesse, for sharing that very informative presentation. Again, we're gonna dive deeper with the questions to come and also to the virtual attendees out there, for, 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 feel free to drop your questions in the chat box as we continue this conversation. Um, today, we also have Shannon Minnick and Rochelle Harrod from Independence Now. Um, Shannon, for those that may not be familiar with Independence Now, please feel free to, you know, update us on the mission, what services you guys provide, and just share your personal story about how you came passionate about the work that you do. And then Rochelle, I'll follow up with you as well. But Shannon. Yes, yeah, Shannon, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I forgot to take myself off mute. But yes, that um, I believe Rochelle is going to talk about our services and then I'll um, help her fill in the gaps. So, um, Rochelle, you want to start off by just talking about our services and then I'll talk a little bit about our mission. Hi, everybody. I'm Rochelle Harrod. I'm the Independent Living Specialist for Prince George's County at Independence Now. I've been with the company for 12 years 
Independence Now is what's called a full service non-residential independent living center. And so what we do is provide services to people with disabilities in Montgomery and in Prince George's County. We have five core services, which are the first and most important is peer counseling and support. There's nothing more um, poignant than coming in to find out about services and you look and you can see somebody and talk to somebody that you can identify with as a person with a disability who can kind of relate to your story and identify with, with what you've been through. That's the main thing. Second um, core service that we think is most important is information and referral. So once you make that initial call and you find out you're speaking with a peer, it's about what kind of services do, do you need? We assist consumers with setting up a plan for what kind of goals they would like to accomplish and the steps that it will take for them to get there. And after information and referral, we do what's called self-advocacy skills training. So once they establish a goal, the next step is to help them navigate around the system. How can you best speak up for yourself and identify what your needs are? Because nobody knows you better than you. So if you need assistance with that, we're here to guide you through the process, give you a pat on the back, some extra support. Next most important step is independent living skills training, which that's where we get into what I like to call the nitty gritty of things. We teach basic independent living skills with our creative cooking class, with our budgeting classes, uh, with our housing seminar. We teach people how to fill out and complete housing applications and gather documentation. So um, we do a myriad of things. It's based on what the consumer needs and what their individuality uh, presents. And the last core service after that is our fifth one, which is transition. We assist people with transitioning back out in the community. Uh, that are in nursing facilities so that they can become independent again. After um, dealing with an injury and being in a nursing facility a number of years, uh, coming back out in the community can be intimidating, so to speak. So we kind of guide them through the process as a buddy and a peer and help them get connected to services. And also with our youth, if you have a youth with a disability that needs help transitioning from school to work, we're partners with DOORS with um, PREATS, which is the Pre-Employment Transition Services Program to help them make a successful uh, transition from school to work, whether it's college, whether it's trade school, whether it's just getting a job just to get your feet wet. If you want to take a gap year before you go to school, so we cover a myriad of things. Again, what consumers needs are met is based upon their individual plan. And so it's all about creating a welcoming environment where someone can come in and feel at home with being themselves and discovering who they are. Did thank I help cover everything, Shannon? Yes, thank you, Rochelle. So in a nutshell, we advocate and we embody independence and equality for people with disabilities. We do this by providing support, guidance, training, education, and hands-on skills for, for people with disabilities in the community in Prince George's and Montgomery County. As you all may know, we are in the heart of Fairland and we love Fairland. We love our community and we love the folks that live, work and play there as we like to do. Our vision is that people with disabilities live independently and fully inclusive lives and are recognized by societies as equals. 
We believe that people with disabilities serve as the best guide of other people with disabilities by improving individual choice and self-direction. Um, for me, what brought me to Independence Now, my injury, I acquired my injury 31 years ago. I was 20 years old. I just told my age, but it's okay. Um, I was 20 years old and I was in a car accident. It wasn't in um, the Fairlane community, but I did live in the Fairlane community at the time. And when I acquired my injury, the first thought was she's going to go to the nursing home and that's where she'll live for the rest of her life. But I didn't have that plan for myself. I knew that I wanted to go back to my Brick Shaney community and live in my community and raise my daughter in my community. Um, so I had to learn to advocate for myself. I had to speak up and say, no, I don't want to go to a nursing facility. I want to go home. I was 21. I had my own apartment in Briggs Cheney. It wasn't um, accessible, for, accessible for me. I called my um, resident manager. I said, hey, this is my situation. I need a first floor unit. She said, it'll take us six months. I said, okay, I'll live upstairs for six months until that can happen. And I learned along my way a couple, for a couple of years that people with disabilities, they were being told what to do. They weren't being asked what they wanted to do. And that's not, I thought in my mind that that wasn't fair. So I started telling people how they can, you know, do things differently. Um, you know, I, I think every day is a learning experience for anyone. I just learned last week how to put in my own earrings and I'm 50 years old and it's been a hard thing for me to do. I just got my driver's license. I'm, I'm going to be a driver in the community of Fairlane very, very soon. So this is very important to me, advocacy, um, being in my own community and taking part in every part of my community. And that's why Rochelle and, and I are here because that's what we want to educate our community on how to become a part, of, a part of your community and being recognized as an equal. Thank you, Rochelle and Shannon. Um, I was at the Independence Now office a few weeks ago um, while you guys were setting up a um, COVID vaccination event. And I must say it felt like family. It was very supportive and welcoming and it was it was a great feel. So. I hear you guys and Thank also you. congratulations on your driver's license. <laughs> Thank you. Um, going back to Jesse's presentation, Vision Zero is the Oedipus for this conversation. Um, in alignment with our general plan update, Thrive Montgomery 2050, a multimodal approach with greater emphasis on health, safety and welfare of non-drivers, we must take the priority over new roadways. We must not take take the pr priorities over roadway improvements of single occupancy vehicles, pardon me, so Shannon, um, in Jesse's presentation, she did touch on the current challenges of the lack of pedestrian infrastructure. Um, I recently had the opportunity to walk with you in Fairland to see the everyday challenges that you face as you travel. Can you share your commute experiences and some of the challenges that you must solve that an able-bodied motorist or pedestrian most, most likely doesn't consider as we're traveling? Okay, so um, Rochelle can jump in on this as well. Um, we both take um, a bus to um, the Fairland community five days a week for work. Um, and we're usually on that bus together in the mornings and getting off at um, Tech Road every morning. It's very difficult when you are um, getting off the bus and trying to navigate the ramp and the walkway. And, and most folks probably can't visualize this, but when you get off the ramp, um, going to the um, street, the the walkway isn't lined up with the ramp. So sometimes um, when getting off of that, um, coming off of that ramp, cars don't stop for us because they don't know if we're going straight or if we're turning. So it, it's, it's, it's a hazard. Um, another thing is the sidewalks aren't smooth. So there, there are humps and bumps and all kinds of things going on with the sidewalk. So, you know, we're, you know, trying to dodge things and, you know, bump over things um, to get to work. 
And um, a, a huge concern is the light at Colesville and Tech Road. So um, the, that light does not give you enough time to cross, to cross the street. Not only, uh, I consider myself a, a pretty quick driver. I kind of slowed down for the ladies, but I'm a pretty <laughs> fast driver. And it's, I still can't get across that street without that light catching me in the middle of the road. So now the light has changed. I'm in the middle of the road. I have speeding cars going both ways. It's very frightening. Um, and, and I'm a fearless type of person. So, um, but I know a lot of our staff and um, folks in our community are afraid of crossing that street and won't go across that street to lunch or to meet friends or to go to the bank um, or go to MBA. So um, they're not getting the full access of the Fairland community. There's a lot of things to do um, in Fairland. And I know that persons with disabilities are not taking that risk to cross that street. And within, um, I would say um, a few years, there has been, um, and since I've been at Independence now, there, there has been two deaths at that light. Rochelle, you have anything that you want to add? Uh, yes, it, there have been uh, two deaths. And also, um, more importantly, just to give you some context, both Shannon and I are power wheelchair users, and power wheelchairs usually can only go a max of six to seven miles an hour. And for us, our power wheelchairs are our cars. So imagine us have, having to play duck, duck, goose, if you will, at the light because our chairs can only go seven miles an hour and we're praying we don't get hit by a car that's going 35 plus miles an hour because sometimes it's not just that light. Sometimes people don't stop and it's not because they don't see us. Sometimes they just want to go and there was one time we crossed at a light and I had my safety vest on at dusk and we were together and I still almost got hit. And so it's very dangerous. I would like to see the county really do something, not just say they're going to do it, but really do it. And when they do it, while it's in process, still have a plan in place. So while they're working on a curb cut or working on a new ramp, we can still feel safe because a lot of times when they do that, there's no uh, transition in place while they're working on the curb cut. And it's not just an eyesore, but it also becomes a thing of our safety as well, because while they're doing the construction, there's no interim plan in place. Thank you for that, ladies. Um, so as I was saying, Shannon, I was with you that day and it was even hard for us to walk on the same sidewalk together. So again, I definitely hear your concerns and I do hope this conversation will be an eye opener to make us all accountable to uphold the principles of Vision Zero and the work that we do. So some of the viewers on this call this evening, along with myself, we are public servants and we owe it to the communities that we serve to prioritize pedestrian safety over maximizing vehicle speed and capacity. So human safety should be first always, no matter no matter what, no matter the type of transportation mode. And so we got to sure. be accountable. Um, so Charles, what are some of the most significant changes that you see becoming more necessary as we make planning decisions and policies that enable increased access and improve the quality of the pedestrian experience? Well, first and foremost, I, I want to say how honored I am to share this opportunity with the amazing Shannon and Rochelle. Um, I mean, you know, everything that I have to talk about really pales in comparison to the street level work that they're doing, the heartfelt work that they're doing in community. And one of the changes that I'm starting to see happen, which is outside of infrastructure, is this, giving them the platform that they truly deserve to talk about the issues 
that exists within our communities, but through a specific lens of persons with disabilities. And they are fearless leaders. Make no mistake about it, because the so-called abled bodies, us who go out and walk these environments with less concern than them, we are the privileged ones who have really everything we could ask for. So I almost feel like, who am I to even talk about my problems when I hear the challenges that Shannon and Rochelle are facing? And you know what? To many people, unfortunately, our brothers and sisters and those who are non-binary who are persons with disability are invisible to the majority of society. And so the changes that I want to see, Lauren, instead of what I've seen, is for people like Shannon and Rochelle to get more airtime, more opportunities to talk about these issues and not just be present, but actually lead the conversation because they have a vantage point that we don't have. I also would love to see, you know, uh, health, our health colleagues and health professionals at this table because they could talk about these sort of adverse health outcomes that result from these deliberate transportation decisions. And so from an infrastructure standpoint, I can give you a rundown of, yes, Vision Zero is great, save for enforcement that is used as a pretext to send black and brown individuals to prison. I think transportation, consistent with my conversation about health, needs to intersect this work much more also with crime because in many places in Maryland, Baltimore specifically, um, there's an intersection with transportation and crime that goes ignored by transportation and mobility professionals. And this unfortunately, this working within these silos are putting our communities at a disadvantage because we are addressing symptoms and we're not addressing root causes and we have to address root causes. So yes, we need investments in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, transit, lighting. I would love to hear Shannon and Rochelle talk about what it's like to do this at night. You know, so much of our conversation centers around peak hour travel. What is happening at night? And what is happening at night for all of us when we talk about people first or people-centric planning? Because I know my brothers and sisters and others who are non-binary or who identify as a member of a sexual minority group, they're being targeted by people on the street as well as law enforcement. So let's have real conversations about all of these problems and the ways in which they intersect. And this siloed approach to community building is not going to address those problems. It would simply only address the symptoms of the root cause. And so thank you, Shannon, Rochelle, and Jesse. It's, it's an honor to be here as a man to share this stage with you all because I know my walk every day is much more privileged than your role. So thank you. Charles, thank you so much for that. Um, I agree with you getting to the root cause instead of just covering up with band-aids is something that we must do. Um, Jesse, the Montgomery County Planning Department is currently developing the county's first pedestrian master plan. The plan will make walking and rolling safer, more comfortable, more convenient, and more accessible for pedestrians of all ages and abilities in all parts of the county. Can you explain its origins and what what is the relationship this plan has with Vision Zero? Sure, thank you, Lauren. Um, you know, I also just want to echo kind of Charles' message and and how and thank um, Rochelle and Shannon for sharing their personal stories. You know, I think. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what we're doing in this planning process and it's a bit more technical, but it, it is always really helpful to have that more personal aspect and I appreciate that we've kind of included you and in, and I think that what we need to do is kind of really work to elevate um, your voice as part of these conversations. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, the um, the county, the planning department is undertaking its first pedestrian master plan. Um, this is kind of a complement to the bicycle master plan that was completed a few years ago. As Lauren mentioned, the intent here is to really make walking and rolling safer and more comfortable for um, all of our road users throughout the county. Um, the plan is going to pay particular attention to 
pedestrians with vision and or mobility issues, um, including recommending design treatments and policies that exceed what's currently in the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, you know, using that as a baseline, but what can we do to go further to really improve conditions for people with a variety of different disabilities? Um, the project team for the pedestrian master plan is going to be prioritizing pedestrian infrastructure using a pedestrian level of comfort analysis. Um, so I can, I'm going to put some links in the chat after I talk about some of the different tools that I'm talking about. Um, but we've developed a pedestrian level of comfort analysis that looks at a variety of the roadway factors that Shannon and Rochelle had mentioned, like the presence of sidewalks or signals, um, you know, crosswalks, et cetera, and, and measuring whether or not what we have in different parts of the county is comfortable for people who want to walk. Um, to kind of link this to Vision Zero, Following the passage of the 2016 Vision Zero resolution to eliminate severe injuries and fatalities, really all of our transportation planning efforts now relate to Vision Zero. So as a result, transportation safety is really woven through all aspects of the pedestrian master plan. So while the primary, primary analysis tool that I mentioned, the pedestrian level of comfort, uses that term comfort, um, a lot of the attributes in that level of, level of comfort are associated with safety such as dedicated space for walking along streets or dedicated space and time um, to cross the street. And in addition, the pedestrian master plan is looking at crash trends. So, you know, it was eye opening and tragic to hear you mention that at Colesville and Tech Road, there have been two fatalities in recent years. Um, but to really look at what are the crash trends that we've seen. And um, we've also recently done a survey that I think received about 2000 responses um, representative of pedestrians throughout the county that captured not just um, where they walk and why they walk, but what they perceive to be different safety issues and what their safety priorities are. So I'll put some links in the chat and happy to elaborate or answer any questions. Thank you, Jesse. So as I dive deeper into the analysis um, of this updated master plan, I really look forward to using all the toolkits that countywide planning and policy has to offer. So thank you so much for the continued work that you guys have been doing on all of your endeavors. Um, Charles, let's go back to you real quick. So given your professional background and experience, please explain the relationships between racial equity, social justice, health, and transportation infrastructure as it relates to increased accessibility. <laughs> that's a that's a big question. What mm -hmm. I would say um, in short is that if you are a racialized minority person or a person experiencing um, if you have a low if you have low income, you're less likely to have access to uh, safe, convenient infrastructure. Thus, the connection between racial equity in, uh, highlights the importance of considering race and racism uh, um, and its impact on the decisions we make regarding when, where, and how we make transportation-related investments. And so the goal here is that our systems become more equitable and inclusive, but we can't get to that if we ignore historically as well as in contemporary times the role that race and racism has played in that decision making. And then I would encourage us, given what Shannon and Rochelle have shared, that we even look beyond just, well, as we take a look within the racial equity conversation, that we look at to within that intersection, um, persons with disabilities, sexual minorities, religious minorities, because all of our experiences are unique on our, our roadways. And if we're not designing systems with everyone in mind, again, we're just treating the symptoms of a much larger problem. And so racial equity, again, highlights the, the fact that race is a determinant factor in terms of who is receiving investments and where investments are being placed and who is thus experiencing um, utopia while others are really going through hell. Yeah, so Charles, earlier you said um, people respond to the environment that they're in. So again, it's up to us to make a, a good environment. So again, it's thank you. It's totally up to yeah. us. Yeah. yeah, so Lauren, if you're in the salon, you know, and you hear someone say the environment made me do it, they may be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so Jesse, keeping the focus on this topic, what is the role of racial equity and social justice in Vision Zero and the pedestrian master plan? Sure. 
Thank you, Lauren. I think this will echo a bit of what we heard Charles say, but equity is a real pillar of Vision Zero. We're not going to reach zero fatalities and severe injuries if we don't really center equity in our approach to transportation safety. Um, we've seen that people of color are more likely to be killed on our roadways than people who are white, um, that they experience a disproportionate number of crashes and severe injuries, and that these crashes happen in the communities within our county and, and more generally within the country um, that are predominantly low income or comprised of people of color. And so what we're doing for the pedestrian master plan, as well as just generally our approach to Vision Zero, is that we're looking to weave um, racial equity and social justice into each aspect of our analysis and our recommendations. Um, so Vision Zero is a really data-driven approach. So we're thinking about making sure that we're thinking about what data do we have about the infrastructure that's available in communities of color and in low-income communities. Um, we're thinking about who is it that has been impacted by these traffic crashes? Where are they occurring? Um, how did the environment make them do it, as kind of Charles was saying? Um, and so really kind of trying to drill down in the data to understand where disparities currently exist in the road network that we have and how we can work to really prioritize the areas of greatest need when we work on safety. Um, but also thinking about community engagement and hearing the voices of the community. And so I think, again, kind of Rochelle and Shannon's stories are really helpful to really personalize things that aren't captured in the data. And so if we really want to do transportation safety and Vision Zero well, we need to not just be looking at the numbers, but really understanding the human experience because the data is not going to tell us the whole story. Thank you, Jesse, for that further um, explanation. So our general plan update, Thrive Montgomery 2050, describes how great places with equitable access to opportunity produces strong communities and people. And again, as a transportation planner for the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan, I'm very eager to getting Fairland stronger through what we're learning today and hearing the conversations. Um, let's go back to Charles one more time. So just to keep it on equity, um, how do you see the role of transportation in creating equitable, equitable communities and how can we improve our systems to have better access where residents can live, work and play? Well, I think the way we make that happen is that um, we should re-educate the public about what we mean when we talk about transportation. Um, I think too often we when we hear transportation, we think car, we think bus, we think airplane. Some of us may even think boat. Or, or bicyclists, my approach to transportation starts with the individual. And so when you create a process that focuses on the pedestrian, you create a system that is much more equitable for all. The problem with the ways in which we've gone about transportation planning uh, historically is that we've centered the automobile in the last, you know, um, last several last couple of decades, I would say. And so what we now have to do is go back to the basics, which is making it much more convenient for our populations that have been marginalized. And what we have to do then is center the importance of people in our planning. And so one metric is if it isn't safe for every pedestrian, whether walking or rolling, it isn't safe. We can't have systems that are just safe for cars, safe for bicyclists, safe for buses that aren't safe for pedestrians and particularly persons with disabilities. So that's the role that transportation can play when we center pedestrians in creating more equitable and inclusive communities. Thank you for that, Charles. Um, so we have coming up on the screen, um, Rochelle and Shannon, a picture of a floating bus stop that you guys provided um, for us. Um, so a floating bus stop for people that don't know, it's a design solution and I use solution in air bu bubbles because we're about to hear what um, Shannon and Rochelle feel about uh, th this design strategy that we as transportation planners use. So here, um, it's used to separate bicyclists and buses for safety and efficiency. As a bus stops, a cyclist is able to go towards the inward bicycle lane, never having to fully stop behind a bus, creating a healthy coexistence between a monstrous machine and a dainty two-wheeler. So Rochelle and Shannon, what are some of the problems that you guys face using these floater, floating bus stops and what needs to be improved to the existing transportation network that would enhance the quality of life for you guys? Thanks, Lauren. 
First, it's important that the floating bus stop issue isn't seen as a us against the cyclists, because many times the cyclists' our lives are in danger on the roadways, and we understand that. Cyclists are too often in danger on the roadways, but it's a mistake to adopt a solution that works for the cyclists and not for others in the community, including people with disabilities. Um, We've had a lot of um, talk about these bus stops and actually um, been down to these bus stops. And I understand as of yesterday, I was having a conversation um, and they said that um, this bus stop in particular have had some um, changes made to it and some improvements. So I haven't been down to see it yet. But if you look at these bus stops, so if you're an individual, I don't know if I can really explain it from looking at it, but if you're an individual that's visually impaired, so individuals that are um, blind, their service dogs aren't trained to turn for these bus stops. They're not trained to say, okay, this is the bus stop. They're trained at the other bus stop. So now we have to retrain service animals because of these sites. So, you know, it, it, it becomes an issue. And it's, it's like, we really need to think first before we start putting these things out. If we're thinking about our community as a whole, this is not safe for persons with disabilities. I sit at this bus stop and tempted to go out twice. And before I knew it, a bicycle was there. And I thought I was going to go and, and, and there wasn't, I'm thinking no bicycle is going to show up just because I'm here. And ironically, two showed up and um, I, I just was afraid to go out, didn't know if they were going to stop. And this, the, the signs for actually for the bus, for the cyclists to say pedestrians crossing is if you look at the, the um, third bus stop, I want to say it's that yellow sign right there. That gives that doesn't give them enough time. If you look at the the beginning of the bus stop from your left, there's a yellow sign. I'm not sure if folks can see it, but that's not enough time to say to a cyclist to stop. Imagine a, a woman crossing with her baby in a carriage. You know, a, a cyclist may flip over me, but this is this is going to be you know, harmful to someone that's strolling their baby across this um this this bicycle um lane. Crossing banks bike lanes is very dangerous. Bikes are silent, they go very quickly, and there's no way to make them stop or slow down again, especially dangerous when there are two bike lanes to cross. So this one um this one, the bikes are going one way, but they're, they're, some of the, um, the lanes have two crossings. And so they're just very dangerous and not just for us, for everyone. Folks don't know like when to walk, when not to walk. And this one in downtown Sewell Spring, I'm telling you, this is on 2nd Avenue. The bikes come so fast and you can't see, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I can see down there, but it happened so fast that I didn't see the bike coming. So if, if you're not going out to these stops and just, you know, it, people with disabilities should have a voice and we can't use our voices if we're not invited to the table. So no one will know that these things are going on until we're invited to the table. And in this instance, it's too late. They're there. It costs money to remove them. The, the county don't want to remove them. We've had this conversation. They don't want to remove them. They want to fix them. And the disability community, especially the blind community, do not see a solution with these bus stops. Thank you for that, Shannon. Um, Rochelle, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes. 
Um, what my um, colleague Shannon so gracefully said, I want to um, piggyback on that. So basically what she's saying is that because the county didn't invite us to the table initially, they're trading in the risk of one collision for another. Because yep. bi bicyclists don't always stop for wheelchair users. They're, they're, they're not kind to us. They don't give us a pass. And we um, work with consumers that are visually impaired um, on a regular basis. We have a monthly uh, support group that we use and we meet it's called lighting your path and in that group uh transportation complaint floating bus stops is one of the number one complaints because not only can the service dogs not see but um the the ridges like where you have the curb cut the bumps to keep us from sliding um blind people have issues with those ridges of because of their canes of course we don't want them to go into the street but that's always like a marker for them not to but just like if we had the right away if they had the right away they could get hit too because again the cyclists aren't kind so where the county messed up again is not inviting us to the table initially because it's putting one community against another as shannon mentioned and they have really traded the risk of one collision for another and it's it's really sad because now it's harder to come up with a viable solution and and we really don't want to say that the cyclists aren't kind because what I, what i'm thinking is they feel like this is their road this is for them and so because it's for them they're going to take the lead on it and so when you do that and you don't think about the cyclists, the people with the disabilities and, you know, our community that use bus stops every day, you have to think of us as a whole. What does everybody need? Let's get everybody together and make up a plan. This was, you know, the county and the cyclists and then it was done and that was that. So yes. it's very important that, you know, we are made part of the solution and you know the, the money that it will cost to you know pull these up the taxpayers money yes, right. that, that that is why we're here today to, to hear you, your stories and to get a better understanding of how we can be more empathetic to create better solutions and thank you for that thank you um do you want to go to jesse um but before we go to Jesse, we do, I do see that we have some questions in the Q&A. Let's see. So we have a question from, again, keep your comments, um, questions and comments coming, and I'll read them and answer them. Um, let's see. So we have one from Anonymous. Are safer crossings with tra traffic lights signaling coming to the study area, particularly at mentioned intersections such as Tech Road intersection, similar to the ones recently installed along Belpre Road? So um, again, as a lead transportation planner on this project, um, currently we're in the, the phases of analyzing the existing conditions and with hopes that we are going to provide a safe, safer experience for all pedestrians, all vehicleists, bicyclists, and so forth. So that's definitely on the table to um, provide safer crossings, certainly. Um, we have a comment from Julie Moritz. This is a great opportunity to strengthen safe access to and around the schools in the study area, Benjamin Banner Middle School, Greencastle Elementary School, and the Fairland Holding Center, which is slated to house elementary schools under the capital improvement projects. I agree, Julie. Thank you for your comment. Um, we have another comment from Anonymous. Beyond the roads and intersections, some of the parking lots, especially the larger ones, are quite pedestrian unfriendly, i.e. Briggs Cheney Shopping Center. Anonymous, I 1000% agree. Uh, we did a site visit, well, I personally did a site visit um, to that shopping center and it is not accessible at all. It's no interconnectivity. So again, that's something that we're going to be looking at uh, with this plan. Um, so yeah, let's go to Jesse. Um, so Jesse, on June 11th, our planning department, along with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, jointly presented the draft Montgomery County Complete Streets Design Guide to the Montgomery County Planning Board. 
Complete Streets is a new approach to designing roads in Montgomery County where roadways are designed and operated to provide safe, accessible, and he healthy travel for all users of the roadway system, including pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, and motorists. Jesse, how does Vision Zero support the forthcoming Complete Streets Design Guide to ensure that streets are designed to, com to accommodate everybody? Thanks, Lauren. I may become a broken record by the end of this, but after the passing of the Vision Zero resolution, we've really been working to integrate Vision Zero kind of into all of our different plans and transportation efforts. And so um, Vision Zero and the Complete Streets Design Guide both work towards creating safe multimodal streets for all road users. And so this new document will be providing a one-stop guide for designing new streets and reconstructing or retrofitting existing streets. And it's focused on three principles. The first is safety, which we've talked a lot about tonight. So maximizing safety for all road users, be they pedestrians, bicyclists, motor vehicles, um, pedestrians with disabilities as well. Um, also focusing number two on sustainability. So how are we designing our roadways to think um, about the environment and enhancing the ecological functions and economic appeal of the streetscape? And then third, thinking about vit vitality. Um, how do we create streets that are great dynamic places? Um, so we don't just want you know, our corridors to be places that you quickly pass through, we want them to be places that you wanna stop. Um, so many of our streets were originally designed for cars and the complete streets design takes a broader approach than that, doing a people first approach to transportation planning and really providing guidance on how we can reallocate space in our roadways to serve pedestrians, bicycles and motorists. And so this is important for Vision Zero because while bicyclists and pedestrians make up a really small percent of our roadway travelers and just about 5% of our crashes overall, we found that they actually make up about half of the fatalities in Montgomery County. So a really small percent of our crashes um, result in a really high percent of our fatalities. When a bicyclist or pedestrian is hit by a car, the likelihood that they'll be severely injured or killed is a lot higher than when two cars collide. And so Taking a multimodal approach through the Complete Streets Design Guide helps us work towards Vision Zero by improving safety. And so we're really doing that in a few ways um, by dedicating specific space in the roadway for pedestrians and bicyclists, and also by lowering the speeds of our roadways. Um, so not just lowering the speed limit, but what are we doing to redesign our roadways so people wanna travel slower? Um, we've really seen that speed is a contributing factor to injuries and fatalities. And so we, in order to reach Vision Zero, Vision Zero, we need, really need to prioritize speed in the way that we think about roadway design. Thank you for that, Jesse. Um, let's go back to Charles. From a social justice and racial, racial equity standpoint, how does walking and cy cycling help make a place attractive for development? And in what ways do they improve the quality of life for residents? Well, ideally what you would have is development that takes into consideration those that are currently residing in a particular place. Unfortunately, though, what we see is that development is being used as a way to gentrify and displace uh, residents. So this speaks to the importance of an effective outreach and engagement plan of which we can have both developers and community, creating opportunities and sharing and experiences together so that the outcome of these plans are not those that displace, but enhance the overall living for everyone in that vicinity. But not just the residents, but also the visitors and the people that come into a particular place to work or to serve. So again, this goes back to what you're doing here now through these community conversations which is engaging with the public in a very transparent way that invites uh, input beyond a survey or even a focus group. So that's the way in which it can. Unfortunately, it has not always done that. And again, we have to take a look at not only our transportation decisions, but also our land use and zoning uh, decisions because they sometimes uh, undo the um, positive things that we are trying to do as transportation professionals by calling for a more auto-centric environment. There is not always a need to simply develop with cars in mind. Perhaps we should develop 
with pedestrians and micro mobility options in mind instead. So Charles, how do you think that we can, you know, promote and encourage more people to walk and bike? Well, you you encourage by what you do and what you show people. If you want more people walking and biking, design a system that make it conducive to do so. So instead of spending billions of dollars in expanding roadways, perhaps you spend more money on sidewalks, on multi-use pa multi paths, bicycle paths, connections to transit, connections to everyday destinations that people are trying to get to, such as schools, churches, uh, grocery stores, et cetera. So you make a community walkable for everyone. And then, as I stated previously, it's not just about the peak hour travel either. It's about those who are walking 24 hours a day. Um, so we have to take into consideration all populations when we are designing our systems. So make that environment so they can respond to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let um, the okay. environment tell them to do something positive instead mm -hmm. of something that is, a, you know, not a, a favorable outcome. But yet and still, one that they think is the safest option, which in many cases it is, it just may have unfortunate results. Thank you for that, Charles. So Shannon and Rochelle, what are some projects that you guys have been advocating for as of lately? And what type of support or public resources would you like to recommend? So um, again, um, we have been lately advocating for um, the, the floater bus stops to be removed. Um, and pretty much that's what the disability community um, wants. Um, I'm not sure that's, you know, it's going to happen because they're there and they're, they cost a lot of money. Um, but they definitely need to be a lot of work done to them to make them safe. Um, and you know, we we are willing to do and go anywhere we need to go or anything we need to do to support, you know, our county on making, you know, our area of living safe. Um, I spoke to Molly and Lauren about doing a walk of um, Kent Mill and us hosting that at our um, Silver Spring office, um, and that still stands. Like we're we're here. We're a part of the community. We want to be seen. We don't want to be in the shadows. So we're ready to put in the work. Whatever needs to be done, please call on us. Yes, myself, Molly, and our team will be to you guys to conduct a walk audit just to get a better understanding and to continue this conversation. So we will be there. Let's see. Um, so as we wrap up this conversation this evening, I would like to go around the virtual room and ask each panelist to share any closing remarks or anything that they haven't had an opportunity to share. Jesse, we'll start with you. Is there anything that you'd like to share that you didn't get a chance to say? Um, I just want to close by thanking everyone for participating in this panel, and it's been really great to, to hear everyone's perspective and experience. Um, the one thing that I will add is that the Montgomery County County Executive's Office recently released its Vision Zero Plan for 2030, the draft version, and so they're currently taking public comments. So if you have comments about floating bus stops, signals, you know, I've seen, we've seen in the chat a few other comments, um, that's an opportunity to really provide feedback on, on the roadmap of how we're going to get to Vision Zero by 2030. And so um, they're taking feedback, I think, until June 18th. And I will um, put another link in the chat for you all for that. So thanks so much for everyone's time tonight. Thank you, Jesse. Rochelle, what about you? Is there anything that you didn't have the opportunity to say that you want to share now? OK. OK, one second. Yes, I just want to um, remind everyone that the community isn't equal until we truly have access for all. Nothing for us without us. 
and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for coming, Rochelle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shannon, what about yourself? Um, anything that you'd like to share? Um, we're excited to be here. We're excited to have a voice and be leaders in our community is what we've wanted, is what we've asked for, and we're ready to put in the work. And thank you so much for the opportunity for Rochelle and I to be here representing the disability community. Thank you for that, Shannon. Um, Charles, what about yourself? Um, please feel for, please take the time now to share any closing remarks or anything that you would like to share. Yeah, I would like to um, echo what my colleagues have said, the co-panelists here. Thank you all for inviting me to be part of this community conversation. Um, as you have laid out here, you can't spell community without unity. And I saw the unity that was present here during this, this virtual gathering. I would, however, like to challenge the county, if it hasn't already, to adopt a racial equity action plan, as well as challenge the entire region to adopt a racial equity action plan. I want to emphasize the importance of racial in that statement, because too often the aggregate of equity is not serving or addressing the root call of race and racism in our planning and decision making. It's not simply enough to have the conversation. You got to walk it like you talk it, as they said. And one way to actually do that is to invest in black and brown communities throughout the county. For too long, decisions have sent a disproportionate share of the funding to more affluent part of the county. And we've seen what that has resulted in. Now it's time to really put your money where your mouth is, create a racial equity action plan, and invest in the communities that need it most. And we don't need another study to tell us that the community that need it most are black and brown communities in the county. So again, thank you for all your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here. I hope to one day host you all on my podcast that's coming this fall titled Arrested Mobility. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Charles. Um, I do know that the Montgomery Planning, uh, Montgomery Planning Department is, we're currently developing an equity agenda for planning to systematically dismantle the institu 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 institutional racism that exists in our work in the, in the, for now and in the future. Um, and the planning board did just approve our equity and master planning framework, and we're currently working on that now. So. We're, we're striving to get there, certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, while we wrap this up, please feel free to drop some questions, comments in the chat box, and we'll get to that. Um, but that wraps up our conversation this evening. And again, I will come back to any questions or comments at the end if, if you guys happen to have thought of any as we're closing it out. Um, but again, this was the importance of people first transportation planning. And I think that we heard that strongly throughout tonight's conversation. Um, I heard several th themes that I'm going to get to work um, with our master planning team. Some themes that I personally heard myself was, again, the racial equity, um, putting everyone first and just making a system for everyone. Um, once again, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us this evening to engage in this discussion with us and a special shout out to our panelists. Shannon, Rochelle, Jesse, and Charles, as well as another special shout out to Council Member Will, William Jawando. Thank you for your support and continued um, presence this evening. As we continue to engage the community for the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan update, please look out for our summer photo contests, listening sessions, and everyday canvassing, which is a door knocking initiative at the grassroots level. Also, please join us for our last session on Tuesday, June 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. to learn more about the mastering of art and community collaboration. Make sure you register for this event if you're interested. And also be on the lookout for a competency quiz and questionnaire for any APA ASLA questions following this session. This questionnaire will help us measure our efforts and determine successful outcomes for the entire series and help attendees that are seeking continued education credits. So let's check the um, chat box real quick. Give me one second.
Um, and definitely don't forget to check out the links that Jesse has sent. Very informative links. I use them personally in my everyday work. They are very, very helpful. Um, I, we see we have a comment from Dan Willem. I see designers looking at one model, one mode at a time, need to look at all the modes at the same time as a system view. We certainly agree, Dan. We certainly agree. So again, please continue to keep this conversation going and carry with you the importance of putting people first, not just in transportation planning, but on an everyday basis, no matter the age, transportation mode choice, race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, difference of opinions, ability or disability. We are all human and just want to be heard and loved. Be kind and compassionate to all. Show empathy, love and light. Again, again, today is a very special day in which we honor George Floyd and how his unfortunate death brought us a little closer together. I want everyone to take care and have a wonderful evening. And that concludes our second spring speaker series, The Importance of People First Transportation Planning.